The U.S. economy is a major factor for voters in Tuesday's presidential election. It's very expensive there. It's so expensive that people just can't afford to feed their families. They can't afford to eat. Everything is sky high. What happens with the U.S. economy will impact the world. We are electing not just a president of the United States, we're electing someone who, whose decisions could have enormous consequences, positively or negatively, for the rest of the world. Today is Monday, November 4th, and this is The Issue from VOA. I'm Scott Walterman. And I'm Lori London. Kamala Harris's campaign has actively been warning business leaders that Donald Trump has a pattern of disregard for democracy and the rule of law that would threaten U.S. economic growth, a closing argument designed to show the possible consequences for companies and workers if he returns to the White House. From Goldman Sachs to 32 Nobel laureates, all whom have said that my economic plan actually will strengthen America's economy. They've reviewed Donald Trump's plan and have determined he will weaken America's economy, he will ignite inflation, and he will bring on a recession by the middle of next year. The former president has argued for higher tariffs to bring more factories into the United States and tax cuts for the wealthy and corporations on the premise that it'll lead to more investment. When you put on tariffs, tariffs are the greatest thing ever invented. You know, I took in, I took in $467 billion from China. Nobody else took in anything. One of the top issues people are concerned about when deciding who they'll vote for as the next president is who will be better for the economy. President Trump will be better because prices will come down. People will be able to buy a home. People will get jobs. Um, feed their families, everything will be safe. A long term, I mean, ultimately, uh, definitely Harris is going to be better. One of the things I think, Lori, that people, that's difficult for people when we talk about the economy is to understand the economy. You always look at it from your own point of view. So when you go to the grocery store and prices are up, that's a problem. You know, when you try to get a car loan, that's a and interest rates are up. That's a problem. It's hard for average people that are just trying to get through the day to think about macroeconomics and and big policy issues like tariffs. Right. Exactly. It's it's more about how, you know, how they're feeling in their own lives. And that's certainly a real feeling. I think people, what they don't probably think about too much is how much of an impact, whatever happens here, does not stay here, that it has big implications for the rest of the world, which is why, in part, why the rest of the world is so focused on watching what will happen here with the presidential election. (laughs) No doubt. Let's get some expert insights into how the U.S. economy plays this major role in the global economy and how each candidate's policies compare in that regard. Joining us now is Robert Reich, former U.S. Labor Secretary with the Clinton administration. He's currently professor of public policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Before we get to the actual candidates and their differences in economic policies, I want to just talk a little bit about the impact of the U.S. economy in general. Can you explain why the U.S. economy and what happens with the U.S. economy matters and impacts the entire global economy? Uh, The United States economy is right now extremely successful. I've been watching or being a an active member of an administration or several administrations that have uh, worked on the economy. Uh, I don't remember a U.S. economy that was as healthy as it is right now in terms of job growth, uh, unemployment being very, very low, uh, the entire economy growing at a very good pace, and inflation being under control. Uh, This has happened because of some very smart steps that were taken by the Federal Reserve Board, our central bank, 
uh, and also the Biden administration itself. Uh, it affects the rest of the world very profoundly because if the United States economy is in good shape, uh, it affects positively economies that are trading with the United States, economies that are dependent on the United States, economies that are in interrelated, integrated in some way through with the United States. Uh, and the United States economy is so large that obviously when things are going well here, uh, things are likely to be going at least better in other countries. We're looking at... Um two very different views of how to move the economy forward after the election. Uh, uh, Vice President Harris is a pretty much, let's keep doing what we've been doing. It's working. Former President Trump wants to do things like impose a universal 20% tariff on everything that comes in the country, higher tariffs for certain other things. Can you talk in big picture terms about the two points of view? Yes. Uh, basically, Kamala Harris wants to continue to invest in the American workforce in terms of education and training and infrastructure, and also at the same time invest in manufacturing, as the Biden administration has done. Uh, we, as a country, as an economy, are seeing a huge revival in manufacturing uh, particularly in sectors of the manufacturing economy that have been for many, many years uh, uh, dwindling. Uh, that's That reversal, that change is enormously important for workers because the manufacturing sector has some of the best jobs for American workers. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, his major promise uh, on the economy is to, as you said, put tariffs on goods coming into the United States, at least a 20% tariff. He's talked about higher tariffs. Uh, the problem is that, number one, tariffs are essentially taxes. They're like giant sales taxes on everything that comes into the United States, paid for by the importers, but ultimately paid for by consumers. Uh, that would have an inflationary effect on the United States economy. It also would have a very regressive effect in terms of the consumers who would be paying the most out of their paychecks, and those are lower income consumers. Uh, secondly, a kind of 20% tariff, at least, on all goods coming into the United States would have a major negative effect on foreigners and foreign companies and foreign exporters who are seeking to get access to the U.S. market uh, for obvious reasons, because they would be uh, their, their access to the market would decline. Americans forced to pay at least 20 percent more as this kind of sales tax for goods coming into the United States would presumably buy fewer of those goods. And we know historically what happened in 1930 when the United States imposed what was then called the Smoot-Hawley tariff on goods coming into the United States from the rest of the world, uh, that provoked an even deeper depression, economic depression, in the United States and also around the world. Uh, it's a extremely bad idea. Donald Trump has also promised mass deportation of undocumented immigrants if he is reelected. He says that deporting these undocumented workers will actually help Americans find jobs. How do you see that that proposition affecting the economy? Well, uh, apart from the humanitarian costs of rounding up and finding and locking up and then deporting uh, some 11 million people, uh, there is also a huge economic cost. Uh, we need immigrants in the United States. Uh, we need even many undocumented immigrants to the extent that they are helping uh, fulfill and fill jobs that 
Americans, most Americans born in the United States, don't particularly want. Many of these jobs uh, are low paying. Most of them are low paying. Uh, many of the jobs uh, are not the sort of jobs that people born in the United States seek. Uh, the United States workforce is aging quite rapidly. And so without these immigrants, uh, the chances are that the United States will slow down as an economy and consumers will pay far more uh, for the goods and services they receive. The uh, Biden administration has put a lot of money into revitalizing chip manufacturing in the United States, and it appears to be successful. There are huge chip manufacturing plants being built in various states. Another thing that he talks about on the campaign trail is um, electric vehicles and electric vehicle manufacturing. And his basic premise is um, China has that market locked up because they have all of the raw materials to make the batteries. We shouldn't even try to compete. Is that a viable point of view? Uh, my understanding is that the Biden administration uh, does want to compete uh, with China uh, in terms of semiconductors and other uh, technologies that are linked to national security. And the assumption of the Biden administration is the best way to compete is to subsidize those sectors and also selectively protect them uh, from foreign competition. Uh, this is... Uh, it's very sensible if there are national security implications and an administration wants to build up a particular industry like semiconductors uh, or even batteries under the Inflation Reduction Act. The Biden administration has moved quite readily into what are called renewable or green energy sectors. Uh, that also makes a lot of sense because the public benefits from those particular sectors are far greater than the public costs when you figure in, even when you figure in subsidies, uh, tax, uh, taxes, and, and also uh, tariffs. Uh, so uh, this package of investments that the Biden administration has championed uh, are important and are beginning to pay off. You know, whether you talk to voters or you look at the polls, the economy is definitely one major concern for voters. And yet, even with all these great economic reports, uh, there are still a lot of voters out there that are not convinced that it's great or, or maybe they're not feeling it. What do you say to that? Well, you can't tell people, voters, that they are feeling something they're not feeling. You can't tell them they are better off than they feel that they are, uh, their subjective feelings are the most important. Uh, but there is a lag time between when the economy is doing well in terms of low unemployment and higher real wages and jobs, and when people actually feel it. I think that many Americans, unfortunately, still feel the effects of double-digit inflation and beyond that, there is the reality that many large American corporations still have significant monopoly power to keep prices higher than they should be if those companies were subjected to more competition, which is why the antitrust agencies of the federal government under Joe Biden, and I'm talking specifically about the Federal Trade Commission and Lena Kahn as chair, and the antitrust division of the Justice Department, and Jonathan Cantor as the assistant attorney general in charge of antitrust, are both very important to the overall Biden economic policy. Well, they are feeling it. You're absolutely right. If you go to the grocery store, you can see the prices are higher than they used to be. And it's it's tough to get by if you're, you know, in a median income household. But to switch slightly the subject or just take it in a slightly different direction, isn't it a problem when you, we look to Congress to set 
fiscal policy, which they haven't done in a long, long time. And so it falls to an agency like the central bank who has to pick up that slack. And, um, you know, when you have zero dollar money, you ultimately wind up with inflation, right? Uh, Well, remember, the Fed has done an extraordinary job, along with the Biden administration, in bringing inflation down from double digits just two years ago to 2.1 percent as we speak. Uh, There is almost no inflation at all. The goal of the Federal Reserve Board was to get inflation down to 2 percent. Well, 2.1 percent is pretty damn good. Um, Fiscal policy is not now a major force in the American economy, except that, and I want to emphasize this, the Infrastructure Act uh, and Biden's, what was called the Inflation Reduction Act, but which, which was really focused on green technologies moving from fossil fuels to non-fossil fuel energies, and also the efforts to improve and fortify chip making, that is semiconductors in the United States, those three together are major fiscal boosts to the economy. But there are particular kind of fiscal policy. That is, they're not necessarily spending per se. They are investments that are designed to build the productive capacity of the economy in the future. those are much, much different from mere public spending. Those public investments in infrastructure, that is, in highways, roads, bridges, and so on, and in semiconductors, and also in fossil, non-fossil fuels, those will help the economy perform better in the future, bring down the deficits, and also enable more people to live better in the future. And just circling back to the beginning where we started here, how big are global spillovers from U.S. growth and policy shock? Global spillovers are are huge and vastly important. And I mean spillovers not just uh, to nations like Canada and Mexico that are directly our neighbors, but spillovers to our major trading partners all over the world. Uh, And those spillovers uh, are positive in the sense that the American economy is growing at a good pace. Uh, There is not very much inflation. As I said, inflation is down to 2.1%. It helps other countries contain their inflation as well, because they can not only rely on the United States economy for lower cost imports, but they can also rely on the central bank in the United States uh, to be responsible in terms of its effect on monetary policy around the world. In other words, so many things, including the U.S. economy, what what happens in the U.S. doesn't stay in the U.S. (laughs) And that's 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 inevitably the case when you're dealing with the the largest, most powerful economy in the world, uh, what happens here uh, has huge consequences elsewhere. Uh, This is why the presidential election uh, is so important uh, and why so many of my friends around the world constantly are calling me or writing me or emailing and saying, "Uh, what in the world is going on? We are we are so nervous. We are we're, we are waiting with tender hooks uh, about finding out what is going to happen in the United States because the, uh, the, we are electing not just a president of the United States. We're electing someone who whose decisions could have enormous consequences, positively or negatively, for the rest of the world. Thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Really appreciate your perspective. Well, thank you both. I enjoyed very much our conversation. Robert Reich, former U.S. Labor Secretary with the Clinton administration and currently professor of public policy at the University of California, Berkeley. It is really interesting because, you know, a lot of Americans don't always necessarily follow big elections around the world to the degree that the world watches our election and the the implications, as he was talking about, are just so incredibly 
huge that it it's it's not limited to this country even slightly it is one of the big truths of american society and particularly american political society Laurie. you're you're not wrong it, we are a very inward looking population you have been listening to the issue from the voice of america on behalf of everyone here at voa thanks so much for spending your time with us you can follow The Issue on X and Facebook at VOA The Issue. And for news 24-7 on our website at voanews.com. In Washington, I'm Scott Walterman. And I'm Lori London. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.